All right, folks, we are on to the last video of the series, number seven. We're going to cover contacts, uh, calendars, some tasks, notes, and reminders, and this is all really light stuff. Um, but I want to tell you that in video six, I forgot to tell you something important. And the final thing about IMAPs is, excuse me, IMAP, is if you are trying to synchronize a folder in Outlook and it's not um, working after you did a fresh download, if you have a company like Network Solutions, GoDaddy, or something, you can call their tech support and tell them that um, you've been troubleshooting this Outlook issue and uh, for a while and it's not working. You can ask them to put a ticket in for second level, which this usually needs to go to an engineer to have the uh, IMAP mailbox refreshed. I don't know what the exact word is per company, but the first level folks are probably going to give you a little hesitation like, no, we can't do that. And you can say, yes, you can. And I know they can because I've had to do this before. Uh, usually just got to push through first level just a little bit and then uh, just say I want to speak to a supervisor because this can be done and they have to do it. It's not something we have control over. Okay, so that is the final part of the IMAP I thought of, of course, after I was done making it. But let's go and start working in the calendar here and I'm going to show you a few things. So here in the screen, we're going to go to calendar. And again, I'm going to use my LinkedIn Lisa Outlook.com calendar just for the exercise today just to show you here. Um, but let's start actually up here in the email accounts, right over here. Now in the data files, here we go. So here's one big problem that people have with Outlook and using IMAP and third party apps and everything is that they want their default calendar to be able to accept appointments for all of the email accounts that they check. So I'll show you over here like here we've got an exchange account and we've got the hotmail and we've got an outlook.com and there's multiple calendars here. Well, the clients, they call and say, well, I just want one calendar. Well, it's kind of hard to have one calendar when you've got four or five different type of email accounts, right? And exchange just trumps. Uh, exchange is like outlook's favorite, you know, they're kind of married. So what I tell folks is pick one calendar system and make that your default. And you can see here that this is also checked as my default. You can check other, um, like you can check the LinkedIn one, the LinkedIn Lisa could be the default, but then my exchange calendar might not go there. So this can get really confusing, really fast for people. And um, what I try to do is, is I talk to them and say, you know, what's your iPhone doing or what's your Android doing? Because with all the different types of accounts, it can get very confusing. And I'll tell you that if you have an email account that you set up a long time ago, sometimes you cannot change the default over here. I've seen that happen before. And the only way to fix it is to create a brand new profile and, and um, set up the first account that you want to be what I call trumped. It's the top one, right? So unfortunately, that's sometimes the only way to do it. And then you add in the other accounts slowly. And you can see here that I've got just tons of accounts and this would be if this was me hiring me, this would be a really big job for me <laughs> to redo all of this, I'll be honest. So anyway, just work with the client, figure out what their main default for syncing is and try to go from there. And these third party apps, like if there was iCloud in here, iCloud just cannot be the default. It is almost very, um, let's put it this way, it's very difficult to make it the default unless you set up a brand new profile with iCloud right away like I just said earlier. All right, now I'm gonna teach folks a little bit about the calendar here. So if you see my view I have right now, this is just the regular week view. But if you go up to the, the bar up here, you can see the month view, week, work week, and day. There's also another view though. If you go over to change view, you can see things in preview mode, list, and active. I use the list mode a lot when I'm troubleshooting, okay? So if you see how many events are down here and in the lower left down at the very bottom, it says six items. So this kind of gives you an idea when you go down to the items to see how many calendar entries the people have. And most of my clients that have calendar issues, it comes from a few things. One is they've had bad import exports from other companies or from other third party apps, very common. And especially if they've come from iCloud and got rid of iCloud, the calendar can sometimes have a lot of weirdness to it. So basically when people call me, they're like, oh, my, my calendar's a mess and da, 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 da. And I go and try to do an inspection to see what the problem is. Now, if they're having a problem synchronizing, the easiest thing to do, let me get out of this view here real quick. 
So the first thing to do if they're having a problem synchronizing is to put a test on your Outlook calendar and then go look at the, the online server, which would be the iCloud, Outlook.com, or whatever tool they're using, and then see if it shows up there, and then to have them go check their phone. Then I also have them do a backwards test where they test the phone to the tool to the Outlook. Now that's where you can figure out what's kind of breaking, okay? Now, if it's a tool problem, then you have to troubleshoot the tool, which would be the iCloud, the G Sync, Companion Link, or whatever you're using, iTunes, whatever. Um, but another thing that people call in with the most is duplicate appointments. Now, I'm very cautious when I do a calendar cleanup because calendar appointments are people's livelihoods, okay? So remember in the past videos, I showed you guys how to do an import export. So we would do an export and it's pretty standard. You know, you know how to do that by now. You've seen me do enough of them. Let's do the CSV next picks the calendar. I'm in and we're going to do, we're going to call this one LinkedIn calendar backup. Why well, I spelled that all wrong. Silly me. Okay. LinkedIn Cal backup December 4th again. Okay. And then make sure that you pick the dates, which I'm just gonna pick those cause that's all it was. Okay. So now what I do is I try to see how many items are in this calendar here. And then I go to the LinkedIn calendar backup over here and I actually compare to see if there's the same amount of items in the export. And I only had seven, but see the top line doesn't count. So I have six. Well, as long as they're pretty close in size, I'm okay with that. All right. But the duplicate issue, uh, it's going to duplicate out the duplicates anyway, but the way to find out how many duplicates actually came in is you can go over here and you can make a sub calendar and we'll just call this one, the test, come over here and hit. Okay. Now there's a secondary calendar. Okay. This one's empty, but it's also on the outlook.com account. Then you want to import. And in this video, here, I'm going to show you how to import any type of calendar into outlook. Okay which let's say it came from another third party or something. So you go to open and export, import, export. Now this time we're going to do an import instead of export, which is basically the same thing, but just backwards and hit next CSV next. Here's our LinkedIn Cal backup. Now here you get to pick do not import duplicate items. Now you got to remember a duplicate item to outlook is even one little dot that's different. So if people have duplicates with the word, copy on it, which happens a lot that won't be seen as a duplicate. Outlook will not flag that because the word copy is not a duplicate. And, um, sometimes you see that with iCloud, we you know when you import in a bad calendar, it'll make a copy of the event and Outlook won't see that word copy as a duplicate, but sometimes they just have corrupted calendars anyway. So we're going to go ahead and hit that import here and we're going to import it into the test folder, which it made it nicely there and hit finish. Okay. So now let's say there was 4,000 entries and you said no duplicates. So over here, the number is now five and up here, I believe I had it as six. No, I had it as five. Anyway, if there was a duplicate, um, these, these are on different days. They're not, it would not import in the duplicates there. And that's a fast way to clean up a calendar. Uh, if you were going to do a full calendar cleanup like that, I'd probably do a double with the back up the calendar to a PST also. And remember I showed you that in one of the other videos, because I myself even get scared wiping out someone's calendar, doing this work. It I've been doing it so long that I'm comfortable doing it, but I still got to admit, I get a little shaky <laughs> just to make sure everything's there. And, um, you know, if someone's on exchange, here's another thing you have to notice or take note of if you're on exchange, um, see the mouse right here. You have to, if you have an issue with the calendar on exchange, you actually have to, have to delete everything. So you first, you go up to the change view and pick list. This makes it a lot easier. Then you have to do control a and hit delete and delete everything off the server. But you, of course you made your backup first. Then you go to the calendar and it has to be empty. And then down here where the mouse is, if it has 5,000 entries or more, you have to make sure the server is done updating and right here, I'm not connected, so it's not going to say it, but you would say, um, or it would say, uh, calendar is updating to the server or something like that. When it's all done, which could take hours or just an hour, it'll say all folders up to date connected. 
that's when you can go import in the calendar without duplicates, okay? And that can take time then because it has to sync up with the server as well. So I'll just let you know that I don't take these calendar rework jobs as a quick one hour job. They're usually two hours or more because of all just the little tedious work. And hey, if people get lucky and it's less than two hours, great. But I always give that expectation. This is a two hour job and it is surgery and you might not be able to use your outlook for a while because I'm in there doing the work I need to, to get your calendar fixed. And then I got a couple more things. So sometimes uh, you might find a snagged up reoccurring event and it's usually on an exchange server. And this is just a little old school trick I used to have is, um, it, what you need to do is make sure you go to the view up here, change view, list view. And because I don't have any appointments in there right now, I just delete them all. Actually, I'll just go, go over to the test. Okay, so in this list view, you can actually see the reoccurring and there's none there. So if this person had thousands of entries, you would actually be able to sort by this little arrow right here of reoccurring and non-reoccurring. And I will tell you that the reoccurring calendar events are the ones that you just got to find them and delete them. But of course you make a backup first and then you can go ahead and start picking away at the old ones. The old reoccurring um, meetings are usually the ones that are corrupted because of a server swap, like someone moved from one company to another or something just got really snagged up on the server. And the only way to, to fix that is to go one by one by one or to just wipe everything out and import only the regular events, no reoccurring. And that, that's kind of a struggle, but I don't get those calls too often. But I'm gonna close the Outlook here and show you, you can see my, my screen there. Um, we're gonna go back to this um, Outlook training for techs. And because I didn't remove this G-Sync it, I'm stuck in it for a minute. But I'm gonna show you that the calendars again on the, um, if it's only an OST file, because um, some folks are using older versions of Outlook, which I believe had the word local one on it. So if you've ever seen, they've updated it actually to this computer only, but prior to this computer only was the word local one. And I used to get a lot of requests for this and I still do on occasion. People are like, I don't want this calendar called local one. I don't know what it is. And basically that is a calendar created when you just have one or two emails with an OST only in Outlook. And there's no PST to connect it to, so that's why Outlook just gives you a, a, a basic cached copy of the calendar there. All right, so that kind of is about the end of my calendar troubleshooting here. I mean, there's a lot of things I do, of course, in an appointment, but otherwise, I don't do a lot with any of the tools up here on the nav bar. And um, I did have uh, some more instruction in my Outlook generic videos that I created for end users if you're interested in learning a little bit more in depth about the calendaring there. So next we're gonna move on to contacts. All right, so now in contacts here with 2013 and 16, this is kind of the default view right here, which I don't like at all because when you double click it, you don't really get to view the whole contact like people are used to from the old versions. And uh, even though it's try you know, they're trying to be all fancy and stuff. It really isn't what the clients want. So let's just cancel out of here and I'll show you the way the clients do like it, which is either in business card view, which this is the old 2010, 2007. People love this view. The card is still kind of popular, but not as much. The phone list is more popular, but the list is actually the most popular. And the people that use the list are the people that have heavy categories and they're big note people, because I'll show you when you open it up in list view, the whole contact form changes, see? So here people can put more detailed information in and if your clients are heavy contact users, they will have all of this filled up and the note section will be filled and they will probably have uh, as much as they can in this whole contact form. So this is why when I handle people with contacts, you gotta be very, very delicate with them because if you don't understand categories and sorting and the view changes and all that, you're, you're dealing with somebody that probably knows more about it than you, your, <laughs> your clients. And let me tell you that I've been schooled before. So I know it well enough now to, you know, take control of the job. But uh, for someone that's new, it might not be so easy for you. Um, realtors really love their contacts. I think they're the people that, uh, when that call me the most, they've got the insane contact lists with everything categorized and everything. 
But anyway, I'll give you just a quick tour here of um, the contact stuff. Now, remember I said that you can watch my generic video if you want to learn more about the how-tos and stuff. But for troubleshooting purposes, really, I don't do much in a contact for troubleshooting. But I just want to show this to you in this view here so you knew about it. And when the view is this way for clients, this is when they can view the categories. I think mine, well, mine are missing from up here. Oops, sorry about that, folks. I don't know where they went, but this might be a question you get from a client one day is, where's my categories? Should be up here. I must have turned them off. <laughs> I'm sorry. But anyway, uh, I know they're over here in my regular email because I showed you guys the categories before. Oh, I know why. Aha, Outlook with IMAP does not allow color categories. I forgot. So I had to quickly switch over here to my uh, profile to show this to you. But here's just, <laughs> sorry to mix you up here, but it just dawned on me. I was like, categories don't show up because they don't work with that. Um, but here is my apple oranges. And in the context, now you can use the categories. So I'm going to switch this view back to list. Now over here, you can see the categories up here. Okay. This is what the clients really love. And sometimes I'm gonna show you a trick here. They don't know this, but the categories are way over here. You can actually drag the categories closer because when you're troubleshooting and you have to go back and forth, it can be pretty bad with these wide screens these folks have. I'll try to get this a little closer here. Generally, you can just uh, drag them over. There we go. So now if they have a bunch of categories here, like assigned to the um, like apple oranges here, we're going to assign it to the blue category and hit yes and save and close. Now it's blue. And when they have thousands of them here in this categories list, you know, you definitely want to see those categories. And if by chance the categories are not showing up, here's a little trick about that. Let me switch over to my email. You can actually go to the mailbox, right click, go to data file properties, go to upgrade to color categories and hit yes. Sometimes when you do a migration or a new profile, the color categories don't show up and people call in a panic and they're like, Oh my God, where's my category colors? That is how you find them. And then they would come back right here. And that's a nice fix for folks that really love their categories. Um, let's see. Uh, the different fields up here are really important to people that manage their categories real well. You can right click and go to field chooser and there's a little box that pops up right here and you can add, remove, uh, whatever details you want from the view up here. Because like I said, most of my contacts folks use this view and let's just put last name up there and see now that adds that there and there's first name. You can put that up there. Outlook has a lot of defaults that people don't like. So if you don't like job title, just pull it down there and it goes away. There you go. You can clean this up to be just what people really want to view every day. And that's their right here. This is their, uh, their life, this context list right here. And like I say, I work with some people that uh, I work with probably every quarter because they have such a mess of how they do it, <laughs> but that's their own CRM system. Okay, the next thing I'm going to show you folks is some address book stuff. And this is a little nice little fix, but um, people generally love their address book, okay? Now, there's a few ways that people call their addresses in Outlook. This is the official address book. It is pulled from the contacts of the email program. And I'll show you over here. So here's my Lisa call that girl. This is my exchange contacts right here. And I just did a quick, you know, click there. Um, if you go down to the CTG at outlook.com, I only have one contact there. This is for people who have multiple email accounts with multiple listings, but some folks are like, well, when I click on address book, I want my addresses to be right here. So then you get to go up to tools options and come down here and pick a custom group. Then you have to pick which one that they, um, that they want as their default, which can be lots of different ones. Here's the custom when sending email over here is when opening the address book. So you get a few more choices when you do it this way. And let's just go pick, uh, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but see a lot of these don't always match up and you got to play the guessing game. Okay. We'll pick my personal email there. So then when you close up and come over here, there's only three people in there. 
you know, in my personal. So it, um, that's, that's the default though for that one. And that also is the default for a new email, uh, for not this account, but up here when you hit two, this picks the last address book. And a lot of people really like this address book feature and a lot of uh, text don't know how to fix this. It's not that hard, but you got to play around with it. And I'll show you guys one more time in the address book here. You got to go and go to tools options and play around with the custom and play around here more to make sure you get the correct address book that, oops, sorry, the contact list that the clients want in their address book. All right, I'll close that up. Okay, now if you happen to get a client that has a lot of contacts issues and you're like a little worried about that, um, this is another job that you can um, work with me on and I can help train you to do it while we're doing it because let me just tell you, it took me a long time to figure out that some of these folks with big, massive contact lists, um, I've seen some uh, some people lose a lot of contacts from, from technicians that thought they were backing up correctly and weren't. And I'm just going to let you know that, you know, you can chat with me in the Facebook group anytime if you have an issue and want to make sure. Because uh, to me, the contacts for people are just so important to get done right. And um, I'd rather have you know how to do it right and have my help. And um, this is, like I said, one of those things I'm willing to help you out on because... Uh, <laughs> that makes me nervous too when I have to deal with people's contacts, but I do know how to do it right. Okay, now we're just going to finish up with tasks, reminders, and notes, and these are not that uh, challenging. So first, let's uh, go to uh, an email, and I'm going to show you over here that if you flag anything in an email with this little flag here, this actually ends up in the to-do list of a task, okay? So let's just do a couple of them. Here's a couple basics from LinkedIn. I'm going to Oops, I'm gonna give them a flag. Then we're gonna go down to the tasks over here. And at the top is the to-do list, and a lot of people mix this up with a task, but this is really just things that are flagged or a task that's due like today or tomorrow. Over here is a real task. And basically this is just, in my opinion, it's just a way to, um, if you were by yourself, you, it's a to-do list, it's a project you have to do. You can actually um, put in some details and uh, you can mark it as complete. You can assign it if you are on an exchange server with other people. You can send status reports. I mean, it has the basic functionality of other things that Outlook lets you do and you can probably insert some, um, you know, uh, PDFs and other Excel files and stuff. But I got to tell you, almost nobody I know has ever called me for tasks help. Very, very rarely. And so there's not a lot to show you, but I'm just showing you here for the sake of the video that uh, I never get calls on it. And people that have their tasks, they know how to manage them really well. And uh, if anything, I've had to maybe restore one with kernel one time. I did. Okay, the other thing is here is um, let's open up the notes down here. A lot of people don't, um, whoa, don't want that note. There we go. Uh, over here is the notes section. Now, a lot of people don't understand what notes are, but the notes are pretty much like uh, post-it notes. And it's in Outlook in a little folder called, uh, they're just called notes. I got test and test two here. Now, this is kind of nifty. A lot of people, um, or excuse me, a lot of techs that are troubleshooting for clients don't know that these exist. And some clients really, uh, you know, really like using their notes. You want to make sure when you're doing your pre-spot check to come in here and look to see if there's data because this data might be gone if you were to delete the profile or had a problem. And you can export these just like everything else. I've done it before. And you can export right here just like you would. An easier way to do it, though, is to sometimes just create a new PST file and just uh, drag them. And I don't drag a lot. You've never heard me talk about that, but I do with the notes sometimes because it can get tricky with uh, third-party apps. But what I love about the notes feature here, and this does not work in Android, unfortunately, but for the iPhone it does, is that there's a notes app on the iPhone that's built in. So when you set up your exchange account on the iPhone, the little notes, which has a, oh, it's yellow at the top with a few lines underneath, that actually connects to your exchange server and I keep tons of lists in here and like grocery shopping and just all that stuff. And when I help a client, I sometimes give a little bonus tip like, hey, did you know that this did that? And they're like, oh my God, I didn't know that. And I'm like, now you can have fun, you know, when you're waiting around doing stuff, you can use your lists for everything. 
and people really like that. And I consider that a little bonus add-on. Okay, now I think we're just gonna get down to the last part of video seven here, and uh, then we're gonna be done. I'm going to offer a, uh, I've decided to have a little like, you know, question and answer for people that have taken the class as soon as we could formulate a big enough group, maybe five or six people to just ask any questions. And um, that'll be called video eight webinar. So we'll plan that maybe after first quarter or something. But to close up here, folks, here's a little list of things I don't help clients with. So if I'm not helping them with these things, you might not want to either because they're really outside of my knowledge range. And there are experts that do know these things better than me. One is creating Outlook forms. Now, you might think it's easy, but forms are really not that easy. And I spent a lot of time this summer playing with forms and I worked with a tech and we did a bunch of forms, but honestly, there's other people that know them much better than me. And if you wanna really play with them and learn, great. But a form, maybe you're like, what is a form, Lise? A form is usually used in contacts up here. In this new contact, you can, uh, you can get this customized so it can look completely different than this with graphics and different fields and, and really make it your own. And they're very expensive to make. And that's why I have this little developer link up here because you can actually make things with uh, Visual Basic and designing and yeah, I played with it. It was just not my thing. So I didn't, uh, I didn't really get into developer level work. Um, manual level contact cleanup. Now, since we're in contacts here, so here's what can happen to me, which does not happen to me anymore, is if you get a client with like 15,000 contacts and they're like, oh, can you just do that for me? Like take out the duplicates and clean up all the junk? Um, no, I don't do that anymore. Not for the rate I'm at because it would be insane how many hours I would spend doing it. I always recommend to my clients to hire like a local virtual assistant or an administrative person or, you know, offshore or whatever, you know, to, to do that uh, data cleanup. And that's, uh, it can take hours and hours and hours by hand. It's just not something a technician, in my opinion, should be doing because we're expensive. And um, I know a gal who's $8 an hour. I know another gal who's $30 an hour and they do all my offsetting of that kind of work for me. And finally, the last thing we're going to talk about in this video is I only fix what I know is fixable. And remember, I've talked about in the videos is that if I can't do it, I tell the client, I've never done this. I'm willing to try. I'm going to bill you a fair fee, but I'm probably going to end up doing all the research and testing on my own. That's only if I really want to learn something. If I don't, I have no problem telling a client, this isn't work I do. I have a referral. And if I don't know of a referral to do the work, sometimes I'll say to them, well, let me go try to find somebody. Usually I do know somebody to do something, but I'm okay with saying no to jobs and you should be too. Because if you say yes to something you're not comfortable with and you get yourself in hot water, it's very hard to get out of the hot water. <laughs> That's my tip for y'all. All right, we're at the end of video seven. I thank every one of you for sticking around this long. I uh, apologize for the the non-professional presentation, but this was the kind of video I wanted to make was something that was me and true technical work and how I explain things. And I really appreciate you all purchasing my videos. Make sure you join the Facebook group, get in there, ask questions, and email me, Lisa, at callthatgirl.biz if you have any questions. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one.